Daniel chapter 6. Daniel the 6th chapter. We're going to stay in Daniel chapter 6 pretty much the whole time. I got a lot to read to you and share with you because it's still, sometimes you just got to read it. You got, you got to see what's going on there. But I want to talk to you today about Daniel the lion heart. We've talked about a lot about lions lately, but he was Daniel the lion heart. He was different. And give you a little background on Daniel's life. He was a, a, a eunuch, if you would say that. Uh, he was not that. Uh, when he was young, he was captured. He was brought into servitude to serve under, uh, under the King Darius. And there they made him into a eunuch, and God favored him. And I don't care. You know, he, in other words, his, his opportunity for reproduction was removed, and yet he began to produce. Let me say it again. His opportunity for reproduction was removed, and yet he produced. Amen. He produced sons. I'll give you the name of three of them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen. He was a man that mentored other people. He was a man that became over a third of Babylon, the largest known city at the time. He became the leader over that city in this area. So when I look at it, and if you think uh, the church, you, we think about the church of the New Testament as a, a gathering of groups. In the Old Testament, amen, we all also see the church in individuals like Moses learning to lead or Abraham learning to trust, David who learned to love, Joseph who learned to endure. And now we find Daniel who was characterized by an excellent spirit. Everybody say excellent spirit. God gave you the ability to have an excellent spirit. Spirit is actually another word for attitude. To have an excellent attitude, a presence about you that is excellent. You've got to be a man and a woman of purpose, priority, and excellence. And you can't allow envy and jealousy to destroy you. And this is important. We're going to really hit on this today. But do uh, Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. Are you comfortable? Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. Going to read this verse right here. Chapter 6, Daniel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Daniel. Chapter 6, verse 3, uh, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. If you would learn as I to uh, start measuring things biblically, I look at our government, I look at our White House, I look at around the country, and I look for somebody who has an excellent spirit in politics, period. I want to see that attitude and an excellent spirit toward people, not just one that's saying, hey, me, me, me. You hearing what the preacher's saying? So I, I watch for that, and I look, and every now and then you'll pick up on somebody in sports that has an excellent spirit. I'm still a Tim Tebow fan because he had an excellent spirit about him. He believed in excellence, and, and because of that, he was often envied, and jealousy was around him. Amen. Uh, he's the first guy that taught me that you could kneel on a football field and honor God. And then the next kneeler came and disgraced our country and God. See what I'm saying? There's a difference in the spirit. Watch for the spirit there. Father, thank you for your word. Anoint my lips to share our hearts to hear and receive. Amen. Let us leave here not the way we came. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. When you get your spirit right, mm, it will produce a quality in your character that will enable you to achieve excellence in every area of your life. But you got to get this spirit right. But not everyone is going to be excited about your promotion. Not everybody's excited about life and life, how life goes in your life and how good things have been. When you get blessed, some of them get mad. They get a little bit envious. And we serve an excellent. Let me just talk to you about God first. He's an excellent God. When I heard worship this morning, I sense an excellent God. I, I heard the band. This band, the way they played and did what they did, it brought out something inside of us. I was watching Benaiah there. You know, Benaiah, is, is, his mind is singleness. He just thinks single. If you're around him, you, you think, well, he's mad at me. He's not mad at you. He just ain't paying no attention to you. All right? Because he thinks single. But when them drums hit, Tony, he was watching them drums, amen, because it, it did something. It excited something inside of his spirit. Psalm 8, 1 says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who has set your glory above the heavens. Isaiah 12, 5, sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. You want to know why you ought to sing? Because God done excellent things. Amen. He's always doing it. Well, Pastor, I don't sing. No, not on Sunday morning, but I, on Saturday night, I saw you on, on, doing them TikTok things. You sang then. You sang when, uh, well, you sang. So when you come to church, you ought to sing, amen? That's why we put the words up on the overhead, amen? You don't have to tote a book in here. 
I know some of you, 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 so you were used to the books, Sister Hicks, back in the day when we all had the hymnals. Amen. They had the hymnals. I remember when I got to church and they had them hymnals out, and they'd everybody pull the hymnal out and they'd start singing out of that. And they'd call out a page, and there's some guy up front, and he'd had, he had his hands doing this. You know, he was trained at the, the music, Tommy and the notes. And, and I didn't know, I didn't know sick them from come here about what was going on. And they'd, he'd yell, he, we're going to do one and three. I didn't know what one and three was. One was the first stanza, and three was the third stanza. I'm singing the second. They're singing the third. Mess me all up. I was in a church once in California preaching that had, had two churches come together, an older congregation and a younger congregation. I was there to preach revival. Amen. They started worship off with the words on the overhead. I, I'm sorry. They started the words off with the hymnals. They had the hymnals, and they started singing out them hymnals, and everybody singing out the hymnals. And I thought, well, ain't this sweet? You know, and I'm looking at it, amazing grace, blessed assurance. Amen. And working through the songs, did two songs, and all of a sudden they went to the overhead. That was for the other part of the church to split, all right? So as soon as they did that, all the old-timers sat down with their hymnals. They didn't sing a single word was on the overhead. They just, uh, they just refused to move. Some people are that way, you know. They always sing, and I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not, it's an old hymnal, I shall not be moved. I'll sit right here and hinder those around me. I shall not be moved. That's what I saw in that church. I thought this church ain't never going to jail. Amen. Sure enough, it didn't. Isaiah 28, 29, this also comes from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel, excellent in working. If you watch his creation, you see how excellent God is. Once he spun the earth and got it working and got everything going and seed time and harvest, it's never backed off. It's just stayed excellent. Amen. We fouled up some stuff. But God is an excellent God. And being excellent, it doesn't mean being perfect. Webster uh, says this about excellent. A thing is excellent when it is distinguished by what it is. Down here in the South, say we say, somebody say, you want something to drink? She say, I'll, I'll take a Coke. What you're saying is you want a soda water. Uh-huh. Up north, they say, I'll take a pop. But down here in the South, we say Coke. I'll take a Coke. What we could mean is root beer or Pepsi or Coca-Cola, amen, or Dr. Pepper, or just something, that does, something dark and cold in the glass. Amen. That's what we want. Amen. That's a Coke. So it, it becomes excellent. It's distinguished by that. Amen. In the business world, the result of believing that all jobs and projects should be formed in an excellent way. I believe that. I believe church should have a, as, be as excellent as you can with the facilities that you've got. Amen. And the finances and the people you have. Can I get an amen? When I pastored in a, in a motel, uh, in a motel room. Amen. And it broke out into the uh, the, the uh, uh, what they call that? Lobbyish area. Oh, well, I don't forget what it's called. Uh, it bre it's a break. I, but we as excellent as we could be. Everything we've done, even when we got that old auction barn H where I met you, we was as excellent as we could be. Amen. It was just a, a, as best you can. So you need to stay excellent. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it all you might. For in the grave where you are going, woo there's neither working nor planning nor knowledge or wisdom. Amen. So get all you can while you're here. Get wisdom while you're here, knowledge while you're here, work hard while you're here, because one day all that's going to be over. You do it with all your might. Everybody say all your might. Right. Ooh, I like people that work with all their might to get after you. It will wear you out pretty quick when you're my age, but they work with all their might. And when you worship God with all your might, amen, that, that thought there is passion, it's fervor, it's zeal or enthusiasm. Again, the word enthusiasm, Latin word, God in you. When God's in you, you got enthusiasm. You're excited about stuff. Well, Pastor, you don't know my temperament. Yeah, I do. I've been watching it for years. But you can still have some enthusiasm with that attitude and that uh, uh, temperament you got. Can I get an amen? amen? So an enthusiast is one who's moved by enthusiasm. Some people call it a religious fanatic. A fanatic is a person who's moved by a frenzy of zeal. A frenzy is a state of extreme excitement bordering on delirium. Delirium is a mental disturbance. What's that saying? We crazy. Come on, I said it again. I said we crazy. Hey Amen. We're crazy about Jesus. We really are. I listened. I had the guys with me the other night, and we were listening to a song, uh, Those Crazy Christians by Brad Pitt. Uh, not, Brad, not Brad Pitt. That's a, I said that. Is, uh, Brad Paisley, the other, the other P. Brad Paisley. And I know some of you, I've never heard that song. It's a great song. Them crazy Christians are always praying. 
Them crazy Christians just seem to always forgive. Them crazy Christians always making casseroles for funerals. Them crazy Christians. Amen. And sometimes that's just what the world looks at us, and that's okay. Everybody say it's okay. I'd rather be known for being crazy for Jesus than be crazy for this world anytime. Amen. So, so we're serving in the king's house. And I believe our work should be excellent. Amen. An excellent spirit produces excellent thoughts. Thoughts produce behavior. Amen. Behavior produces action. So now we get to Daniel. Around 15 years of age, he was kidnapped, lost his family. As far as we know, his family were killed. He was made into a eunuch. He was put into service here. Amen. And uh, there... He had began to have an excellent spirit. Daniel chapter 1, I'll back up just a little bit for you. But Daniel purposed in his heart. As a young man, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. We often teach around January about fasting, the Daniel fast, that a lot of us go on soups or salads, and, and we, we abstain from meat, drink a lot more water, amen, leave caffeine alone, certain things. like It's a Daniel fast. It's saying, you know what, I'm not going to just... <laughs> Miss Linda Rich, you hurt me yesterday by bringing me that um, coconut cream pie. You hurt me. I'm telling you, I told you at the door, you shouldn't do this to me. I'm trying to keep my weight down, and here's that pie. I put it in the refrigerator, and I thought, I'm going to leave it right there. I'm going to hide it behind that door. And somewhere around dark 30, temptation knocked on my door, and I said, Lord Jesus, help me. Amen. And I walked over, and I took it out, and I said, well, you know what? It's just a whole pie. I think I'll slice it. Amen. At least slice it. And I sliced that thing into fours. <laughs> and I know that properly you're supposed to, when they cut that thing into, you know, what would y'all say? Eight. I didn't make it that far. <laughs> I chunked a fourth of that out. I tried to get Joseph to help me take some of it. Maybe he will help me later. Oh, it was. I need that Daniel fast again quick. <laughs> Daniel was a man of purpose and priority. Amen. He, his decisions determined his destiny. He knew that. So he began to, began to control himself. You have decided yourself in the person you are. Whoever you are right now, you decided you'd be that way. The person you are today. Listen, it ain't your parents' fault the way you are. You keep blaming them if you want to, but they long gone. Amen. you got to decide yourself today to who you want to be tomorrow. Amen. you got to start working on it. The person you are today is the person you choose to be yesterday. He disciplined himself to pray and to fast regardless of the threat, the power of priority. That's what he had in his life. He began to prioritize his life, and it shifted everything. Our life is the sum total of all the decisions we make every day. And those decisions are determined by our priorities. How we use our time every day eventually defines our lives. Amen. I know that's a lot of stuff written there, but you got to, how am I going to deal, deal with my life today? You know, I've often said at funerals, we got two days in life, this day and that day. And it's how you live this day that's going to determine what happens that day. And it's the only day I got right now. Amen. So I look forward if there is a tomorrow, but don't know for sure. Life was designed to be simple, not complicated. Amen. Breathe. I mean it. Breathe. I worked on that tower this week that 40-foot tower that we have a zip line off of. And often I'll look at the people we hook up, and I'll look them right in the face, and I stand between them and the danger. And they know when I've removed my body, they're going to have to fly off that thing. And I'll look at them, and I'll say, breathe. And, they, and I mean, they've shut down. They are. And I, and I watch life happen to people, and they shut down. And so I say, breathe. And I'll say this, let me hear you. <sighs> then I step out of the way as they exhale and send them. Amen. There's something about just taking a breath. Life should be a lot more simple than what we've made it. The key to simplifying life is priority, putting first things first. Amen. You know, we lose productive people 
when we don't prioritize. We squander opportunities, momentum, self-respect, priorities established in the most important things. This is what Daniel did. Amen. He had a primary focus on God. He placed an order of importance, his prayer life, his highest value and worth upon his worship. Amen. First among all others was God. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1, it pleased Darius. That's the, that's the king to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, 120 to rule this kingdom, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first, that the princess might give accounts unto them. And the king was, so their government, you got 120, amen, but then you had three main ones. But out of the three, Daniel was one of them, amen. So he, uh, over a third of the kingdom, he was ruling that thing, amen. And he had to give an account to the king, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princess. Why? Because he had a Say it, excellent spirit. That attitude was amazing, was inside of him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. So when you spoke of excellence in the area, you often could use the word Daniel. Like Daniel. You know, we're ruling like Daniel. We, we're praying like Daniel. We, we live, you know, they, they're living like Daniel. Got a heart like Daniel. There's something about Daniel. But then an old sin. It's one of the oldest sins of, of, this, of the world. Envy. Jealousy. It's what caused Cain to kill one quarter of the world population. The world population, one quarter, died because of envy and jealousy. Amen. When Cain took out his brother, Abel, thank you, Lord, out of envy, envy, discontent at another superiority. Whenever people desire what you have but refuse to go your route to get it, that's envy. Your children can envy you. Employees can envy you. Family can envy you. Whenever people desire. It's not about their things. It's their contented attitude that people envy the blessings of God, the peace that you walk in. You, you, why are you so peaceful? And I will tell you again, when you get the more stuff you get, the more trouble you got. It's just the way it works. The more money you have, the more issues you have. Life can start getting complicated. That's why you've got to learn how to keep it simple. Now, now, let me walk you through this real fast. When jealousy gets out of hand, respect is a powerful thing. When you respect and honor people, that's a powerful thing. That means to elevate a person. That means to say, you know what, I, I, and I get this a lot, and I, I, I'm constantly trying to put myself back down because I can tell you that a, a turtle on a pole didn't get to the pole by himself. Amen. And oftentimes we, we, we put people up on poles where they don't need to be. We put them up too high. But, but, but it's important. I elevate, you know, the longer I live, the more I begin to elevate my father. When I was young, I didn't understand it. But the older I got, the more I honored him, the more I respected him. Amen. So that's important. So you can see this in Daniel's life. Second, to admire somebody, to esteem them. You know, I admire their walk. I admire the way they, 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 they live there. I, I admire the way they coach. Uh, uh, my, my daughter's fiance is a, is a baseball coach, and I watched him coaching, and I admired the way he did it. He, it wasn't about winning the game as much as it was playing the game correctly. I, I, I liked the way he didn't get, I mean, now everybody else yelling at the ref, and he's calm and cool about it. I, I admire that. He meant to admire somebody is a powerful thing to appreciate their life. There are a lot of people in here that I admire. Amen. And then you begin to pattern or to emulate, to emulate somebody. Now, remember, you're an individual. You have your own excellent spirit. You do not have to emulate everyone. Here's my problem. If I get down around Louisiana, I begin to talk like them boys down in Louisiana. Huh? You know, I can, I can start emulating them. I get up north, and God help the Yankee that comes out in me. You know what I'm saying? We get around people, and we start talking like them, and we start acting like them and walking like them. You, you, but, and that's okay to emulate, but you got to be aware right there because if you're not careful, you go another step, and you begin to envy them. And when you begin to envy them, you're in trouble. Amen. So that, that's where it begins to break down. So then we begin to compete with them. I want to not only be like you, but I want to be you. I want what you got. Amen. And this is where murder enters in. You have to be careful here. So in this case, they begin to envy Daniel. We're going to see that in just a minute. They begin to get upset with him. Amen. To, to, they had discontent over his superiority. And then comes murder. We murder people with thought and action and tongue. We begin to put them down. Amen. Be careful. 
as you walk through life. This can happen to anyone. As a pastor, what, what I do as a pastor, I look at other pastors. I watch them. I very seldom will listen to other pastors because what happens to me, I start emulating them. I can't get no help over here. I get like Pastor Rick. I get around Pastor Rick. I just want to buck and jerk and, and uh, start screaming and make everybody come to the front and get their hands up. Amen. I, that's got to be me. Amen. I have to be me because uh, uh, that, that's who God made me to be. Amen. So other people, well, I like to pastor this church, that church. Go ahead. Just do what you need to do. But I still got to be me. Amen. It's very important to stay that way uh, because I can't live in their shoes. When I look back at Cain, if Cain were able, he would have never killed Abel. If Cain were able. But he got mad, he got jealous, he was upset, he was envious over Abel's sacrifice, was that of flesh, Cain's was that of probably corn, amen, or something out of the garden, and God looked at him and said, you, you just yanked something out of the ground, boy, amen, but, but Abel went and he hunted and he brought something, he brought a right sacrifice to me, and because of that one moment, Cain gets mad at Abel and kills him out of envy and jealousy. That's an old sin, it keeps, it, here it is, it keeps rearing its head. It does it in politics. It does it in sports. It does it in school. It's always happening. You got to be careful with it. Now, stay with me just a little bit here. So then they, they couldn't find no wrong in a righteous man. They're looking for, we got to find something for this guy. This guy is just too good. He, everything about him, he's just excellent. Amen. He loves God. Let's figure out something. So they, what they did is, verse 7, all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute. I'll tell you what we'll do. We're going to come up with a law. And to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into a den of lions. Now, that's, that's rough right there. But they're going to come up with a law that's going to try to trip Daniel up. Now, listen. It, they said all of us, all of us made this decree. That's a lie. Amen. This is the first lie in Daniel's den. It's a lie. Daniel's not even involved in this. They just, it's a majority rule here. Daniel wouldn't agree to it. Well, you know, what do we do when a government establishes a law against the Word of God? See, here's where things get sticky, church. Citizens of America, ambassadors of the king. You hear what I'm saying? I mean, we, we both of those. But now you've now you got to deal with it. Amen. In other words, I say, in Daniel's case, don't speak for me. I didn't say that. He was faithful. He had the heart of a lion. He was a lion heart. He prayed anyway. Verse 10 tells us that now when Daniel knew, K-N-E-W, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he knelt down upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had always done. And there they were with their cell phones recording Daniel through the window. Amen. Getting it down, making sure that they had him praying to the God of heaven. Amen. Prayer is so important. It is so important. You know, once it was once said that a nightclub owner opened a nightclub near the only church in a small town. The church organized an all-night prayer meeting. The members asked God to burn down the club. Burn it down, Lord. Burn that wicked den of iniquity down. Within a few minutes, lightning struck the club, and it burned to the ground. The owner then sued the church, which denied responsibility. After hearing both sides, the judge said, well, it seems that wherever the guilt may lie, the nightclub owner believes in the power of prayer while the church doesn't. <laughs> you got to take responsibilities for your prayers. Can I get an amen? Now, I can't tell you how important prayer is, but I'm going to try. It divided the Red Sea. It made a rock gush water in the wilderness. It quenched the flames of a fiery furnace. It muzzled the jaws of lions, and it voided the poison of vipers. It conquers devils and, and dispatches angels, and it saves the most wicked. What prayer does, my friend. So the disciples, you know when the disciples said, Lord, Lord, teach us how to raise the dead. Lord, teach us how to raise finances. Lord, teach us how to deal with young people. Lord, teach us how to handle our marriages. They never said that. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. Hmm, H, teach us to pray. Because if you can teach us to pray, I can handle my marriage. 
I can handle the young people. I can handle my finances. Amen. You'll talk to me in the secret places in my heart. Amen. You'll begin to direct me. Teach us to pray. It'll help you when somebody passes out of your life whom you love. Teach us to pray. Amen. It'll help you. And it, 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 don't go to that chair. Okay, I won't. You're not schizophrenic too? Come on. You know you talk to yourself. Luke chapter 2, chapter 11, verse 2. Teach us to pray. So Jesus said, give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Lead us not into temptation. You see, you can't pray and stay mad. You can't pray and stay mad. It, it doesn't work that way. You can't be a hornet. Amen. At that moment, you, you got to let it go. So he says, forgive. You can't pray and talk about your pastor. I'm just saying that for other churches. <laughs> you can't pray and stay mad at church family. You can't do it. You can't pray and stay grouchy or have a negative or defeated attitude. To pray was to break the civil law. Woo! If you pray, if Daniel prays, if he prays, we got him. Well, he knew it. He knew what they were doing. So he goes in with his lion heart, and he begins to pray. Oh, God, they're setting a trap for me, just like David did. It's a snare for me. Those who hate me have set a snare for me. They're trying to trip me up. They're trying to get me in the, in the pay, front pages uh, of the, uh, the, the Babylon Bee. They're trying to put me right there right now. I, but I don't care. I got to talk to you, God. I need help running this government and doing what I do. See, the Bible tells us straight up. You know this. Peter said, submit yourselves with, for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king or the supreme authority, or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Peter's saying, J.C., for us to obey the laws of the land. He tells us that. This is what you're to do. You ought to drive, you should, you ought to drive, drive speed limit. I hate thieves. Don't be stealing. Don't do wrong in the land. Quit, don't, don't abuse domestically. Don't, don't hurt folk. Do the right thing. Okay? That's it. So I've had people tell me that. They say, well, you, you should not be going against the laws of the land. Okay, who said it? Peter said it. Everybody say, Pete said it. Come on, say it. Pete said it. Pete said it. I'll never get done with this sermon. Y'all don't help me. Everybody say, Pete said it. Pete said it. He also said, Pete also said, Acts chapter 4, verse 18, Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. It's a law. Don't talk about Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. Hello. You've got to learn how to live life in the civil and in the spiritual, you got to know when, if there's a law that needs to be broke, to break it. Amen. And in our case, of course, you understand that when it comes to abortion, we believe that law is crooked and wrong. Amen. We stand for the mothers. We love them. We, we, we already have heard me say this, amen, a hundred times. But I can tell you this. When I went before that judge, I had my Bible in my hand. And I said, I will take any, any sentence you got from me. He said, okay, 60 days and put me in jail. For protesting against abortion three times. And the only thing that scared me, the only thing that scared me through that whole time was the third time I was arrested, they had lifted a nun up over my head to get her out of the way. And uh, she was uh, vertically impaired and horizontally blessed. And I was afraid they're going to drop that woman on my head. That would be the end of it. I wouldn't have got to jail if I had done that. Amen. Just stay with this right here. Daniel could have compromised. We do. He could have compromised. It's the law. I, I can't pray. I, I'll pray quietly. I'll pray in silence. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't open my windows. I won't let them hear me. He, he could have said, he could have said uh, you know, I'm, uh, I, it's, a, it's good. He's a good old king. He was a good old king. Darius, like Daniel, he loved him. He promoted, he's a good king. We got a good president. You know, it's a good president. I'm just going to obey the laws. I'm going to do the right thing. Or, or how about when in Babylon, do as the Babylonians do. You know, I mean, 
I'm going to do what they do. Uh, isn't that how we are when in Vegas? Shut up. It's funny how we justify ourselves in uncertain locations we go to, huh? Hey, Amen. I'm sorry. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to those watching right now. The word scandalize, and this is what happened is in the Greek means to take the bait. Take the bait. It's the cheese on the trap. Amen. Take the bait. And at this moment, there was taking of the, the bait. We're going to set the bait out there. Don't pray. It's a law. And Daniel took the bait. You knew, they knew he was going to. Amen. Now the king's helpless because he made the law. Because he thought they all agreed. Verse 13, then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention. By the way, he ain't even one of us. He ain't even one of us. So why, why, why king? He's an exile. He's a slave y'all brought in. Amen. He not even, pays no attention to you, O king, or the decree, the law you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. Priority. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. I can't believe I signed something. I can't. It's a law. I, I, I'm living between a rock and a hard place. Then the sentence in verse 16. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel. They put him. They threw him into the lion's den. Now, guess it's not something you walk in. It's something you fell in. Amen. It was a big den. Had a top on it. They dropped him down in the lion's den. Then, and the king yelled to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. You didn't just serve him on Sunday, but seven days a week, 24 hours a day, for all the years you've been here, Daniel, you have served this man. You didn't get jealous. You didn't get mad. You didn't, you didn't get bitter because you lost your reproduction. Amen. You didn't do any of that. You stood there the best you could. You lived life the best you could. May your God, whom you've been serving continually, rescue you. Amen. It was a priority. Daniel... Daniel had a heart like a lion, and he was all backbone. Amen. There's something about him. And so here we realize that deliverance, your belief will be tried. There are two things that are coming to our nation. I want you to hear me now. It may come after I'm dead, but it's on its way. There are two things coming to America. These are what I believe. Persecution and revival. Persecution and revival. Your belief system will be tried. Amen. Everybody here that believes in God, your belief says we're going to get tried. It's something's going to happen in your life. So beware of that right now. Daniel 6, verse 20. Then he came near the den. He called to Daniel in an anguished voice next morning. Y'all know what the anguished voice is. That's when you get that letter from the IR. Oh, yes. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Silence. The bit of silence. Roar. Roar of the lions. Roar. Silence in the day. What's going on? Next verse. Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel. <laughs> he shut the mouth of the lions. They've not heard me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed. Amen. He gave orders to lift Daniel up out of the, out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Oh, I got to start closing here, but watch this. Amen. When they lifted it, here's the thing. You know this is happening. All of them people that voted, all them people that, all them donkeys that signed that, they all around the den. They want to hear the crushing of the bones. They want to see the blood on the lions. They want to see the death of Daniel. Because Daniel's in our way. He's stopping us from running this country the way we want to run it. Amen. He's righteous. He's right. His heart's right. He's excellent. He's got a great spirit and attitude. The king likes him. We're jealous of it. We're envious of it. So the truth of the matter is, he broke the law that we had the king sign. We tried to trip him up. We're ready to see them bones down there. And all of a sudden, they hear the words, Oh, king, live forever. At that moment... Their heart began to palpitate. Amen. Sweat began to pop out on their brow. They knew that a miracle had just taken place. Daniel used the word angel. They it wasn't just me here all night. I had an angel hanging out with me, and he shut the mouths of the lions. 
Verse 24 says that the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den. Along with their wives, woo, and children. You're talking about cruel. When you make a decision, you often affect your whole family. Wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. When King Darius wrote to all the people, nations, and men of every language throughout the land, may you prosper greatly. Talking to Daniel. The decree went out, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues. This is, this is, a, this is a king saying this. He, he sounds like a prophet. He, I mean, he's the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues, he saves, he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He's rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Man, we need some lion hearts in this land. We need people to stand up and love God like they never had before. And it starts, it starts at home, you know that. Amen. It expands out on your job, at school, or wherever you're at. But this man calls the king to declare that God is the living God, that his kingdom endures forever, that he does miracles in the heavens. Amen. He sends angels to rescue. That, that's the kind of testimony we need to hear. Can I get an amen? So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyprus the Persian. Heads bowed, eyes closed just for a moment. My prayer is that you be a man or woman of purpose, priority, and excellence. That you learn to be as excellent as you can in all of your ways. Your attitude is the one thing, the only thing that you can control is your attitude when life hits. Don't allow envy and jealousy to destroy you. What you've got to do to stop that from happening in the name of Jesus is celebrate other people's victory till your victory gets here. Hang on and say, I, I'm, that's my brother in the name of Jesus. I'm excited for him. My sister is blessed with a new, I'm excited for her. Amen. And you keep doing that, it'll keep jealousy and envy out of your life. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, give God praise in here. Every now and then, I get a letter. This letter came in this week. I want you to know about this. Uh, if our servant leaders have come up, amen. There's a tithe and offering envelope. Be excellent in your giving, faithful in your giving, and continual in your giving. Amen. You say, well, I'm going on vacation. That, that don't stop your giving here. Those watching online, same thing. you got to be excellent. I ne if I'm gone out of town, my tithe is still in the house. I learned this years ago. People who consider this their house, if they're gone for a month, I'll get, sometimes we'll get a check for almost a whole year because somebody has been out of town for a year, but they're going to send a, their tithe for a year. This ain't a commercial. This is how I live. And that's what I've seen in this house. Be that person. So I get a letter from a family. Her name is Miriam. His name is David. Last name Mueller. Flood hit them in 2017 and 2019. They said, we've had enough. They moved to Tennessee. Moved to a place called McMinnville, Tennessee. David weighed about 250 pounds. Last time I saw him before he moved, he came back to church about six, eight months ago. I didn't recognize him. Bobby lost about 100 pounds. He got so thin, he had stage four cancer. Walked into church, he said, Pastor, I need to testify. Walked up on the platform, I let him share. He talked about the peace of God. He talked about what he had learned at the little country church. He talked about faith in God. And that he just, he, he said, you know, I'm, I'm giving it all over to God. And uh, it was a powerful testimony. Well, he got healed. He went on to be with the Lord a few weeks ago. In that, his wife sent me a letter. And again, I didn't know them that well. You know, I just knew they came to our church in New Caney. Dear Pastor Jerry, she said, I suppose you're wondering about the check I'm sending to you to help out at the church. She sent us a check 
matter of fact, Brother Lars check. As you already know, David had terminal cancer. He succumbed to the disease. Remember how you said a lot of people live well, but few people die well? David died well. He never showed fear, doubted God's will, or, com or complained. He stood firm in his beliefs the whole way through the battle. He was a prime example of how a dying Christian should behave. He believed what he said, what you, what you said. He believed it to the very end. David, of course, he had this life insurance. That's why this check's here. The funds you're receiving are a portion of the first fruits. She's quoting scripture here. The tithe, the first fruits. Let me find where I'm at. That belong to God from, this, from his insurance policy. The reason I chose your church is because I believe in what you're doing. Not only in your dedication, fulfilling your call to preach, but also in how you are reaching out to help your community, the disabled, amen, and your support, the missionaries. Most importantly, I like this, you preach the word to the forgotten people, the misfits, as you say, and the unchurched. These are not easy people to reach, but you guys are giving it your all, heart and soul. I love that about you and Lori. Your preaching is unique. I've heard, you've heard me say this. When you don't know whether to call something good or bad, call it unique. <laughs> so she knew I've said that before. Your preaching is unique, but in a positive way. Different bait for different fish. I learned that from you. It's my hope and prayers that the little country church be blessed. Sincerely, Miriam. I got that letter, and I, I told uh, Joseph and my son Josiah, I said, this is our, it's not the money, it's the words. This is our reward for getting to do what we do, is that people may leave this place and still be blessed. Talking about misfits and people that seem a little out of place, you loved my friend, my brother. I called him my third cousin, David Forsythe. David came to this church on Tuesday nights for prayer meetings. David ended up with uh, his mind began to slip from him. My wife and I had to literally take him in. My, I had my wife take care of the, I didn't want to be involved in the medical, the financial, but we had to get him put into an independent living, then assisted living, then memory care. David passed to go on to be with the Lord Friday night. Pastor David, Pastor Joseph, Josiah, Natalia, and I, and uh, Steve and Tammy, we sat in that room with his body. And we realized that it was just his earth suit. And we stayed there till the funeral directors came. That we lifted his body off that bed. He was one of the misfits. I want to thank you for loving him. I want to thank you for not being offended with him. See, as his mind began to slip, he began to say things he shouldn't. And he sure liked the ladies. <laughs> he complimented my wife, Skylar, Tony, Nata every woman in here got Randa. David got on to him. David said to him, he said, no more. Quit complimenting women's figures. You can compliment them from the face up. I was with him on Thursday. Thursday. I had my daughter Katie with me. Walked in the room. Had the little nurse come in. Beautiful little black nurse. I had her pull her mask down. I said, girl, you're so cute. Then this, this, uh, this other girl come in. White chick. Uh. Come in, she, uh, for, she was a hospice nurse. And I said, Woo, David, look at here at all these pretty women. David smiled. One day before he passed this earth, he looked at me, smiled, and he said, Y'all sure got some bodacious faces. <laughs> As we give today, we're believing God for jobs, better jobs, more money. Less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Church, I got to go. I done went over time. Amen. You, you know, say, you want me to say what you're going to do?
Okay, I'll do it real fast. Amen. Clothing ministry is open. Amen. Food pantry out there at the other campus overhead. It's going on two or more prayer. They're going to be praying on Tuesday night. Amen. They got Bunko going on and brunch. August the 13th. Please see Cheryl Malik for that. Swap. Seniors for the purpose. Going to gather on the 14th. Is that going to be next week? Yes, it will. On the 14th, on the Sunday, seniors going to gather. Forge Youth Ministry going to kick off August 17th. That's a Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. If you know any teenagers, get them here at 7 o'clock. Let them meet Pastor Joseph. Amen. Lift is going to be going. Amen. Ladies Ministry in Crosby Campus, Faith Over Fear, September the 9th. You're going to sign up in the back for that. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We will see you all next week.